The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Net Wealth Investments Limited, ABN 85090 569 109, AFSL 230 975, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Advice tech. As if it wasn't enough to be across TMDs, Alpha, Beta, Rule of 72 and all the other nuances of financial advice. Now, advisors are expected to be across all the technology options too. And there's so many of them. But never fear, Peter D is here. Join me each week on a journey of discovery through the software and apps on offer for advisors and advice businesses. So let's dive in, fellow advice explorers. This podcast is proudly sponsored by NetWealth. Imagine a world of investment choice that goes beyond borders. Open up a world of investment opportunity with NetWealth, where you can access local and international securities, as well as bonds and foreign currency options for wholesale clients. Offer your clients flexibility, transparency, and efficiency with managed accounts, managed funds, and access to non-custodial assets. A world of investment awaits you. Discover it at netwealth.com.au forward slash woo. Hello and welcome to the Ensemble Advice Tech Podcast. I'm Peter Diamantitis and the guest joining me here today to deep dive into capital preferences. Well, the first based in New Zealand studied at some amazing institutions, including London Business School, Georgetown University and the Kellogg School of Management. But I think far more importantly, was in the marching band at school, which as an Aussie kid was something I used to think only happened in movies. So I'm very excited to hear that it's actually real for kids going through school uh, in the US. And now our second guest is also dialing in from the land of the long white cloud. He adds Stanford to his list of education experiences. This is some very educated folks, uh, listeners. And Actually, look, he handled with incredible panache the never-before-done feat of being on stage in Sydney for the most recent Ensemble PD Day while another speaker was on screen from overseas. Thank you so much for joining me on the show, Bernard Del Rey and Pat Spanner. Woo! Welcome, welcome. Thank you, Thank Peter. You. <laughs> what a pleasure to join you. And I won't, I won't torture any of the audience uh with any mellophone notes from my marching band days, but I appreciate you bringing that up. <laughs> Not at all. It truly, it, as I was looking through the profile, it's that my eyes went straight to it. I'm like, that is fascinating, particularly, and it's an interesting coincidence because there's a recent movie from New Zealand that's uh, based on a true story about a um, some New Zealand rugby players that learnt marching band so they could play rugby to go and be able to watch the Rugby World Cup. It was the only way they could get tickets. It's a hysterical movie. I, I really should have looked that up, actually, to remember the name. But the minute I saw it, that's what I thought of, combination of New Zealand and marching band. Uh, but I'm imagining, you, did you play rugby at school? You probably didn't, being in the US. No, I'm not sure no. I knew what that was back then, but we didn't play no, probably American not. football. Probably not. Now, I'm but very we have keen. adopted it now, Peter, I can assure oh, I'm you. Sure, well, you don't have a choice. If you guys are in New Zealand, <laughs> you'd lose half of, the, you're half of the topics to talk about if you can't talk about rugby uh, union, for sure. Exactly. Now, I'm really keen to dive into all things capital preferences. But first, I'd love to get to know each of you through your use of technology. So let's start with you, Bernard. What is your most used emoji? Do you even use emojis? I I do. I mean, with uh, I have six boys in our household ranging from <laughs> 7 to 17. So there's lots of wow. bras and emojis that go back and forth. <laughs> uh, you know, I think I go with the, the fist pump, which is always uh, – a nice one to congratulate nice. uh, someone, and that would probably be my most used. Nice. I, k- kids, particularly teenagers, can say whole paragraphs with a single emoji. It's it's yep. quite a gift that yep. they have. <laughs> now, how about you, Pat? What's your most used emoji? My, I'm probably a little, you know, straight list. I use the high five quite a bit. Um, no. But- the question prompted me to go look and see what other emojis are there, and I don't use firecracker TNT nearly enough, Peter, so I'm going to be amping that up in my emoji lexicon. Uh, Nice. Well, if you want to take it to the next level, there is Bitmoji, which actually creates images 
using your sort of like like a cartoon image into things like emojis. So that's like next level emoji activity. Um, and I can have whole conversations with friends of mine using Bitmoji. So enjoy in the future. That's a pro now, tip. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, for you, if you had to delete everything off your smartphone, all of the apps and just keep three, which ones would you just have to keep? Um, I would definitely have to keep zero because we run our business pretty much on that and I'm not right. a big zero lover. I would keep uh, smartly because I need mm-hmm. to keep the team paid and that's our one of the ways that we uh, do that. Yep. And then I'd probably keep the New York Times app because I, nice. I do love reading the New York Times and I miss it between my fingers on a daily basis having grown up in New York. Lovely. I think the team probably are, are quietly relieved that you'd be keeping an app to keep them paid. I can hear them cheering in the background. How about you, Pat? What would you? What would be the three apps you'd keep on your smartphone if you had to get rid of the rest? Well, Peter, I'm a checklist kind of person, so uh, I used to do formerly Wonderlist. I'm a longtime Wonderlist, but then Microsoft acquired, and you know what happens. But I still used yeah. to do. Yep. Uh, and then the uh, Kindle app, I have to say, just for keeping up with my reading. And then um, Starwalk. I'm an armchair stargazer, and it's such a great app to view the night sky, especially moving from Northern Hemisphere to Southern Hemisphere and reacquainting myself, or acquainting myself, I should say, with all of the the wonderful stars and constellations um, from this side of the planet. So, yeah. Oh, I love it. I um, was lucky enough to go and see the Northern Lights up in Alaska um, year before, well, New Year's before last, and we all downloaded that app, which lets you track um, the Northern Lights and when they're coming, the auroras are coming over, and it becomes a bit obsessive. It can be something you can spend a lot of time doing. So I'm, now I'm going to have to download another app. This happens every time. All righty. Let's dive into capital preferences, shall we? So, Bernard, look, let's just for high level, just in case, I'm sure everybody in the in listening in have heard of you guys now, but just in case they haven't, where do you guys sit in the advice tech space? You know, what category do you fall under? And generally, what do you get lined up against if people are sort of comparing you against others? Yeah, I mean, I think we we fit into the advice tech stack, and I think the most, I would argue, the most important place, which is in this uh, space of understanding the end client and trying yep. to get a real um zeroing in on who their true self is so that you could give them all the advice that that's necessary, but from a grounding of who they are. Um, I think we take quite a unique way of doing that. That's kind of um, very modern and based in this new field of decision science, but we do get compared to solutions that fit more into like the legacy methods of, uh, which would be questionnaire based, um, questionnaire based tools like Affinimetrica or right. something to that effect. So yeah, that would be profiling sort of yeah where we stuff, fit yeah. in. Um, so yeah, that would be yeah where we, okay. Where we kind of fit into the tech stack. I'm curious, what started you on this journey? The the journey started when I met my academic co-founder, a gentleman named Shahar Kareev, who some of the ensemble listeners may have seen at the PD day. Mm. But he's a decision theorist and a game theorist from University of California Berkeley, arguably the the most prominent and well thought of in the world in that category. And when I met him, we just connected over this challenge of understanding clients mm. and um, you know, not just in the domain of risk, but in many, many different domains. Their their preferences over their goals, how they uh, prioritize their own well-being versus the well-being of their children, and all the real meaty, meaty questions that are really hard for anyone to articulate mm. uh, and answer cleanly. And so his work really caught my attention and we thought it was a problem worth solving, bringing this technology and methods from academia into the advice landscape, but in a very, very practical and usable way. And so that's kind of the journey we've been on. And it's an interesting approach, isn't it? Because it's sort of, um, to use the the car vernacular, it's it's looking under under the hood a bit more. It's it's yes, okay, we could do something quite superficial, but let's look under the hood and see what's actually going on. It's trying to really get to the to the root of of why they're doing what they're doing. Yeah, I, I think advisors always tell me they love highly engaged clients, and the best way to have an engaged client is to kind of get their hands dirty to get them making some of the decisions that are at the heart of the trade offs of how you work with your money. And yeah. achieve your goals, and so that's that's the essence of what we that's the essence of what this technology does. But more importantly, it's like um, 
it is it is a way to get to the heart of the matter much more quickly and then yeah. leap off of that and have all the rich conversations that you want to have as an advisor, but with the benefit of like the the x-ray that's kind of right. painless, painless for the client. It's an interesting balance too, isn't it? Like I was just, as you were saying that, I'm reflecting on the fact that if you, I've seen questioning tools, which, uh, you know, must feel like a full body scan for a client. Like it's like, stay still for two hours, yeah. don't move and we're going to do a scan. Like it must feel like that. And it feels quite invasive. Whereas if you can balance getting the insights with, it feels yeah. relatively painless and, and you know, fairly short. That's There's probably a sweet spot there, isn't there, where it, it's actually going to have some value, whereas the longer that thing drags on, I probably the less relevant it is. Yeah, I just would highly agree. I think yeah. we always say, I'd rather see a client make six decisions in 60 to 90 seconds in these simulated environments than, if, than have, uh, you know, a 20 or 25 question interview go forward because it just you know, you can't you can't lose the client and explaining yeah. verbiage and other things, and they just retreat further and further from the actual conversation that you know. Versus having them lean in and make some choices and see what that what that yeah, tells and you. Look, and these things you know are an uh, evolution, I guess, because you know you use the tool you have at the time, you know, and historically um, we've had these uh, sort of basic question tools. But I've got to say, you know, my background in training is actually actuarial studies, right? So I have a leaning towards maths, I guess I'd say. But when I got into financial advice, what stood out to me was risk profile had a veneer of of mathematics and science. Like it sort of looked like it was scientific and mathematical, but actually the numbers and the questions, even the formula applied was so basic, but also it relied on the client understanding a fair bit of jargon and a fair bit about how things work, and then also deeply understanding themselves. And I just don't think that level of self awareness exists in most people out in the wild. It's a very, it's very, very difficult. Yeah, mm. and I think um, I won't, I won't harp on the benefits of science, but science should be able to significantly deem risk this yeah. process for the industry, and it's, yeah. it's certainly why we've seen part of the reasons why we've seen success. But the, but the primary reason why advisors or clients would consider something like this is it's a much better client experience. Yeah. It provides true insights and it puts the advisor in the driver's seat with those insights in a much more palatable way than I think a questionnaire could ever do. But if you have your favorite questions from any questionnaire, you know, there's really no science in them. It, it, like as far as mathematical science, yeah. don't, don't let them go. Like you know, continue to ask them, but you know, yeah. If you go to the doctor, you always get an X-ray. You should always you should always look at a client's decisions uh, yeah. in the same way that the advisor would look at them in this case. Well, and I think no, and and we need to go into this a bit further because I think that when I took a look, one of the key differences for what you guys are doing is you're looking at what they do rather than what they either think they do or what their understanding is. And that's sort of, it's it's that, well, let's watch the actual behaviors that might occur in the wild for this individual, as opposed to what they feel they should say, or, you know, any of these things that are more, I guess, academic in some of the ways that clients can answer these questions, right? They can sort of answer them the way they feel they should, or any, any of those things. Whereas what you're trying to draw out is just what they would do in situations, really make it that, that live experience, because we all know that that's what's going to happen the minute something occurs in the market. Well, how are they going to react? What would their instincts be? So is that true? Is it more about trying to draw out what what they would actually do? Absolutely. Yeah. We always yeah. say actions speak louder than words. Let's let's look at what you would do in these carefully crafted uh, scenarios and then we'll we'll kind of we'll unpack that together, right? And that's right. where the moment of the client and advisor come together to kind of look at what was what was learned and have a conversation around that. So it's very much action speak louder than words. And Peter, and I guess, had one advisor oh, yeah. tell me just the other day that um, one thing he really liked about the decision scenarios was, you know, Bernard talked about getting a client's hands dirty. He, the mm. language he used was it sort of simulates the emotional tummy drop of yeah. a loss. And so now it's sort of really engaging the client in a lean forward kind of way, whereas yeah. with a risk tolerance questionnaire or a survey or something like that, that's kind of a lean back experience, uh, you know? So so I think what you're saying there is in terms of getting at that, what's going on inside and getting at how how they will behave, there's, there's something very powerful in that. Yeah. And it's, you know, it is a challenge because 
I think there is a lot of, and you guys can probably give us insight actually, but there's a lot, you know, between genders, there's a lot of a difference in the way that somebody will ask these old, answer these old questionnaires, you know, what, what's, you know, imposed on somebody the way they should behave or what was, you know, from their parents or the way they feel they should be or like all sorts of things, you know, does an entrepreneur feel that they should be taking more risk because that's what entrepreneurs do? Like all sorts of things that are this conditioning or the stories we tell ourselves, which are significantly different from the way they behave when things actually happen. So, it you know, unpacking that and I'd imagine helping them discover themselves something, you know, it's like when you do the personality testing stuff, we're like, oh, that's true. I am like that. Like, do, do you find that's what happens that these clients get to, to come to a realization about themselves that maybe they just didn't, weren't aware of before? Yeah. I mean, I'll jump in, Pat, but you, yeah, absolutely. I think if you yeah. had a, if you had a brain scan of people doing the activity, it would be alive, right? Because yeah. they're confronted with some really fundamental trade-offs that channel all kinds of, may, may raise all kinds of things for them. Uh, and that's exactly what you want. You want them yeah. super highly engaged while they're talking about this very serious journey of their financial well-being, right? And that's, you, if you want the best outcome for the client, you don't only really want to understand them as deeply as you can. And you know, looking yeah. at their decisions is, is what does that. Yeah, and I can share an example, uh, Peta, from uh, Amanda Golder, who's at Fowler Group. Yep. Uh, she was telling us that, in her words, that it kind of gives her the skill to figure out what clients aren't saying. And yes. she shared a story of a client who um, had shown a history of aggressive investing. And this is a client that she'd been working with for some period of time to see that. But the um, the revealed preferences method, our, our, our risk profiling tool, picked up loss aversion in that client, which is separate and distinct from risk tolerance. And you know mm. the, the mathematics underneath our method can tease those apart. And so Amanda organized a meeting to probe into that, and she discovered, lo and behold, there was a personal issue that the client hadn't disclosed. Um, that had come up somewhat recently and was making them was behind that loss aversion. So right. being able to get at that, you know, sometimes clients aren't tuned in enough to be able to tell you that. In other yeah. cases, they maybe don't feel comfortable telling you that. Is there an illness in the family? Are they feeling some job insecurity? Right. And it's sort of that insight and the prompting that leads to that deeper discussion and set of insights that, you know, in this case, Amanda, I think would say that's a really important interaction with that client to uncover that. Yeah. And Pat, I'll just follow up. Like, and this gets to, you know, when you bring some, when you bring innovations into an industry that haven't been there before, um, you do need to knock down some walls, like, you know, yeah. the, particularly the wall of, you know, I don't see a lot of value in profiling my client every year. Well, if you approach that, when you approach that through the lens of the tool that you have today, like a long questionnaire, like you can't imagine fielding anything like that yeah. to a client every year. <laughs> You'd um, dread it. You would. <laughs> you would. It makes no sense, which is why it's not done. But you know, how much more sense does it make if you're just doing a quick kind of check in and say, "Hey, you know, we're heading into your, you know, heading into our annual review together. I'd love to take a quick look and see how you're making decisions with your money, you know, today." Yeah. And they sixty seconds, they make a few decisions, and with that, you know, you just have this this very rich insight into okay, are things the same as they've always been? Or are there some of these things that need to be explored and what might they be? Um, and so I think that's, you know, that's what's really exciting about any sort of innovation or technology is it does open up new possibilities. Um, but you have to kind of see it in order to appreciate that, which is always the challenge. Yeah. Well, it's interesting you say that because I'm just reflecting, I just went in for a, you know, your normal checkup to the GP the other day and they take your blood pressure. Now, it's not because they think, wow, you look like you need your blood pressure take. This is just part of the process, right? Particularly once you get over a certain age, you young folk listening, you probably haven't had that yet, but people like me, I mean, 50 last year, they start taking your blood pressure regularly. And clearly it's a similar thing. They're taking it, they check it. And then if it's outside the band of what they would expect, it prompts a conversation, you know, like it's it's just a way to then dig deeper. Um, so, yeah, to sort of look at this as that similar tool, right? It, it, it is very similar to to me. I was just playing through the example of the the annual blood panel, right? Yeah. And I I'm a kind of person who likes to have my physician sit down and show me 
step through the results. How's my LDL and HDL? How does that compare to the trend line from the past number of years? And, yeah. you know, I've just turned 50 myself. And so, you know, that just instills a level of confidence, you know, even yeah. if things haven't changed year over year, that's a new kind of, that's a different sort of confidence, right? But but I want to know and, and know that my physician knows that about me. So uh, I see a lot of parallels there. And it's an interesting... Yeah, it's an interesting approach to where I look at other other industries out there and, and particularly coaching, like outside of money, you know, people in coaching or who deliver programs, you know, that are looking for change or trying to deliver transformation. And and interestingly, what a lot of them say is like every facet of what you're doing for the client in the, say, their initial experience with you, each facet should deliver some value. They should see, wow, even if I just did that, that would feel like I got something from that, or like I've had a result. Whereas for, well, decades, really, even longer, financial advice has simply been saying, look, future you in 20 years will be really glad you did this. Now, I'm sorry, but I don't know about anybody else, but future me in 20 years is tough to even con- like conceptualize, let alone care enough to actually take the steps You know, somebody wants me to take now. So I think shifting you know, the way we look at things more to the way ho- all sorts of other industries do, which is each thing should feel like I get something out of it. I feel like I've either learned more about myself or learned more about, say, finance. You know, Would you agree that's the case? There's this shift happening? Absolutely. And I think What's what's exciting, particularly like this challenge of getting to know a new client or kind of onboarding right. someone, you know, it's it's very very difficult for you know a financial advisor, or someone in the advice industry, to demonstrate value quick. It is a mm. long game, so to speak. Mm. And so, um, you know, if techno if if technology such as this can allow you to drill into someone's clients a client's decisions in the acquisition phase in like 60 or 90 seconds and then be able to pull out some insights and say, look, we don't know each other really well yet, right? Uh, But, you know, just in that short little interaction, I could see some amazing things about you. Number one, you're a really good decision maker with your money. Like you you get it. Like we're going to be great partners. You know, give them some confidence that actually they're not as broken as they think, uh, build their confidence. And then- you know, share some insights um, quickly uh, because otherwise it is a long journey of demonstrating value as a financial professional to a client. And so ways that speed that up, I think, are exciting. This is this is maybe just one of them. But. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, as an industry, look, and we're generalizing, there's people out, here, out there that have been nailing this for a long time, but broadly and probably even globally, finance probably trails most interesting in terms of really understanding the behavior of the consumer. Like I think there's lots of other industries that could probably predict to the minute exactly what somebody's going to do and when. You know, they've bothered to really understand what drives people and how they behave. Whereas I feel like finance for a long time has probably just been telling people how they should behave. You know, we haven't bothered to really understand how they actually do behave. We're like, no, 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 you should be doing this. Is Do you see that comparison? you know, between finance and other industries? Pat, I don't, I, I'll, I'll jump in quickly, but it's, I think it's, yeah, I mean, we are a sophisticated industry and we love making that sophistication known to yeah. the client. Um, and we spent a lot of time as an industry perfecting alpha and portfolios yeah. and tax optimization, all of those things. I think clients are really craving to be understood. Mm. And, and that sometimes only, you know, that only can be done through engaging them and making it a client-centric process. And other industries, you know, have have mastered that to a certain degree. Like, you yeah. know, my doctor doesn't sit down with me and just ask me questions. They send, you know, they send things to the lab. They they use diagnostics to to reach a quicker and better understanding. And that might be yeah. that might be the highest standard of example. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, that that is. And I think you you can probably see it even. It, when I think of the cleverest or the ads that made me both laugh, but also laugh because, wow, that's on the money. You know, when you see something and you think, wow, they really get who they're targeting this either product or service or whatever. Um, it's very rare that in financial advice or finance generally, it's that we get that. You know, very rarely do you see something out there where it's a bank or a major institution that sort of gets it to that level when we're just not quite as evolved that far, I think. I think we're getting there and I think we're all heading in the right direction. But I think, like you say, we focus so much on the complexity that um, I think, you know, we've got a journey now 
to get to the other side and truly understand the, the public, you know, and the individual. And there's a there's an interesting dynamic with financial services. Just you know, in my past, I've studied lots of different industries, uh, and in financial services, there's a little bit. In some cases, I find a false security in just how many numbers there are floating around, and uh, you know, those numbers are quite often on the product side, as we were talking about before. Um, yeah. Even when you do get them on the consumer side or the customer or client side, uh, you know, when it comes to financial advice, the frequency of those transactions isn't the same as, you know, buying consumer goods on Amazon, right? Amazon no. can tell a whole lot about your buying behavior from your behavior Due on their frequency. website. frequency. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. But in an advice context, like, you know, ideally we're, you know, we're not serving day traders typically. And so we don't yep. have that kind of transaction frequency. And so the ability to use the the data to really get a read into that level of insights, it, mm. it can be surprisingly somewhat limited in financial services. So, you know, tools that can reveal and dive straight to the heart of a client's preferences become relatively very powerful in that kind of context. Absolutely. So let's sort of dig into that then. In terms of um, the tool, then I'm betting that, you know, the first or the primary user is, you know, the advisor. So in partnership with the client, hey, there's there's this experience you can go through. Is is there other, have you seen in, in other practices that have taken up the tool that they get any of the support stuff or anybody else in, engaged in either utilizing or, or, you know, sending out the tool? Do you find it's broader than just the advisor within the practice? Absolutely. I think it, it, it- Anyone who's supporting the advisor and client engagement, whether that's para planners um, or what have you, yeah. are absolutely getting involved um, and using the tool directly. And then I, I would say too that um, you know compliance leaders are really keen on looking at the decision making and preference. What we'll call coherence. How coherent are the preferences of the clients that we have in our practice? Because it can be a compliance risk if we don't have a solid understanding of a client's risk preferences. And we know across the six decisions that a client might make inside of our activity that some small fraction of clients will make those decisions in a way that reveals that they actually don't have coherent preferences. So right. you know, there, if you're a compliance officer, you want to be able to pick out who those folks are. Uh, so you know that's an audience you might not have expected, but these, you know, these folks really care about uh, what is the science behind the tool and, and how can that help them do their job more effectively and really, you know, provide that safeguard for yeah. clients, but also for, you know, the advice firm's brand and, and the advice firm itself. To that point, Bernard, I'm, I'm curious, like, what does a an outlier for you guys look like? And let me give you an example. So, um, you know, I've been looking at uh, the Gallup strengths testing for something quite different, which is quite interesting. And I love the idea of, of the positive psychology part of that. But they've got this thing that can appear depending on the individual who completes the test. And it's very low percentage of people that get this, but it's basically says that the, you know, this respondent's um, answers are so neutral that the, you know, the results are going to be a struggle because, they were in the middle for all the answers. Do you have similar situations like Pat was describing where it's like, okay, this person's a bit of an outlier or the way they're answering is an outlier. It's going to require some more digging to be able to get something sort of really useful um, for them and the advisor? Yeah, I think we we do. And we we call this metric decision consistency and okay. it's it's an economic parameter. It basically says, does is the client advisable in this right. moment? Do they have well-formed preferences that we can serve. And it's, uh, you know, I think it's a super important hurdle on two, yeah. two areas. One, you're bringing on a new client, you've never worked with them before, and you kind of want to make sure they got clear enough preferences that you could work with them in this very, in various domains. The domain might be risk preferences, but we're, we also have a platform uh, that's in the UK now that we're bringing to Australia shortly on um, values-based preferences or ESG-based yep. preferences. And so those types of things you want to make sure the client is advised on it as a coherent set of references. Mm -hmm. And then obviously on the back end, as you get towards the later years in a client's life where they'll be making financial decisions and there's risk of cognitive decline, you know, you right. do want to be able to test periodically that the client still has coherent preference risk preferences. And we've interesting we've been able to prove it 
we've published papers in an academic setting, Shahar has, that, you know, if if an, if someone does not have economically rational decision making, they are going to destroy their own wealth. And right. that's a risk to them, obviously, but it's also a risk to the advice firm. And so you'd want to have the kind of gold stamp that says, yep, this client's an economically rational decision maker at multiple points in that process yeah. to de-risk the business. That's so interesting. So it's, you know, in the front end, you know, sort of almost checking for the self-destructive. <laughs> so the, I mean, you know, my grandmother would have, she's, she's was Scottish and she'd say, she'd call those people flibbity gibbets, right? Just all over the shop, you know? So you want to flag that because it's absolutely true. A, there's nothing more frustrating than trying to work with somebody like that, but B, you're right. The, the outcomes are just yep. not going to make sense. They're not, it's because that's just why, wherever they're at at that point, it could be emotionally or otherwise, they're just not going to probably be able to work with you to get something that's really fruitful for them. Absolutely. And I think what when you when a client does go through the process and they have very clear preferences, which is the vast, vast majority, like 90, 97, 98% mm. of clients are going to be absolutely fine, to be able to continue the conversation with them and say, you know, here's where your comfort zone lies here's where we're going to have you invested given your goals and goal achievability uh, and, and the tension between those two. Yeah, That's really where the power comes from in making this whole thing, the whole financial planning journey, client-centric. Because you can very clearly articulate the value I'm going to provide in this relationship is helping you manage this tension that exists between who your true self is and where the and we were going to be invested given your goals and aspirations and be able to track that over time. Yeah. Um, and to Pat's earlier point, when you detect things that might be problematic in the future for the client, like their loss averse, you just can have a plan up front. Yeah. Kind of say, we're not in this environment now, but when we are, right. we're going to have a plan for volatile times. Here's what we're going to do together. And just the confidence factor with the client just goes way, way up, um, particularly for the non financial. Mm. who you know maybe is a little bit along for the ride and not feeling as confident in general but sees their preferences incorporated into the mix and then a plan mm. reflecting that i think it's just yeah just a powerful definitely and i think you know we've got a, an aging society too and and i know even in our in our business we're dealing with a lot more people that are older um and you know it's super lovely to deal with but we in fact have a we actually have a team meeting agenda item that's about any clients we need to flag as potentially vulnerable. Like we just consciously now are well aware of, hey, you've been chatting, whole team, you've been chatting to people. Was there anybody where you, where you went, okay, wait a minute, you know, is there something just that, that you know, they're getting older um, and things get difficult for many reasons. I like the idea of this type of tool being another way to sort of just get a check on that. You know, let's just see what their decision making, you know, what sort of shape it's in. So, which it hadn't occurred to me that could be a really useful way, you know, to keep, because often the clients at that point too are a bit, you know, they are who they are. Um, but to be honest, um, I'd even be tempted to be quite upfront you know, earlier on, maybe in that journey, maybe they're sort of in their early 70s and to say, you know what, we're going to keep on doing this when we do your reviews because this is our way of checking in on you too. And most people would be relieved for that. Oh, okay. <laughs> Somebody's keeping an eye on this for me. Yeah. Now, I'm curious, and Pat, I'd love you to to share, what type of practice or is there any sort of theme of, of you know, who implements the tool really well, you know? So so what have they either done beforehand or or the way they implement that you just find really sort of lights up their use of of the capital preferences tool? You know, how do they really get it humming? Yeah, well, you know, with, with, with any tool that you're introducing and, you know, molding your bedside manner around, right, yeah. you're going to take um, – a couple of iterations with uh, across some friends and family, probably first, just to sort of get your feet wet. Yep. Uh, and, and and then you put it in, in front of the clients and go through it with clients. And you sort of feel like you've got your sea legs there when it comes to, right, here's how I'm going to set up and frame what this exercise is. And of course, we provide guidance on all of that. But, you know, yep. every advisor likes to put that in their own words. Mm. Uh, and then, you know, the, what we see is folks will often start with, clients who they have who are individuals, not part of a, of a couple um, or a household. Yep. 
and and because that's a that's a relatively you know straightforward case to deal yeah. with. And then we find that as as folks you know advance uh, through a couple of clients that way, they'll get comfy with the notion of ah now I can use this with the partners in my client base, and that's where we find it really um, you know the master users are getting a lot of value because they're right out of the gate being able to independently profile both of the partners right. in that relationship. And to Bernard's earlier point, you know, it's quite often the non-household CFO who maybe is along for the ride. And, you know, in the old pen and pencil questionnaire world, it was the household CFO who would lean forward, pick up the the, the pencil and fill out the yeah. questionnaire. And the non-household CFO would sort of, you know, sit on his or her hands and, you know, wouldn't necessarily feel seen and heard. And so this is a way yeah. that we see kind of the the master users really pulling in the partner and bringing the partner in and franchising the partner early on to make sure that yeah. partner feels seen and heard and, and bridging the risk gap there. Um, mm. You know, we some of the research that we've done on this one, uh, Peter, uh, studying couples' risk preferences where we've independently profiled both partners 60% of couples, the two partners have a meaningful difference in their risk preferences, meaning <laughs> I bet they do. <laughs> right? Meaning that they're at least one portfolio shift away from each other wow. on a five portfolio, you know, lineup, efficient yeah. frontier. Right. So and when you have those differences that kind of go undetected, those couples are six times more likely to decrease assets under management in the next 12 months. So it's like, yeah. wow, that, that matters, right? Picking that yeah. up as an advisor and really bringing in, in particular, the non-household CFO. And so, um, you know, I, I'll, put, I'll put some color on that with a story. Um, mm. uh, David Carter, who is at New Zealand uh, Financial Planning here in uh, Christchurch, he shared a story about a couple that he worked has been working with for quite some time. And he, for the first time, administered the risk profiling activity to the two partners. Yeah. And because the profiling activity incorporates uh, goals in it, he was able to show that the loss averse partner that that she was going to need to be able to get a bit more comfortable with going outside of her comfort zone in order for that couple to have a chance of meeting their goals. And right. it helped David the way David tells it it helped her connect the dots there and understand that. But then he said, interestingly, the husband came in later afterwards and thanked David because David had surfaced attention that that couple had struggled to really put their fingers on and work right. through in the past. So it really helped it put David in a spot where he could help connect them to find some common ground there. And it's like, wow, what a powerful story um, there of, of using the tool to bring couples together where, you know, in most cases, uh, couples may may not see eye to eye on, uh, Absolutely. on this, right? Yeah. And it is natural in any relationship, the dynamic when, when you're uncomfortable with something or it's not how you feel or you feel it's going a direction you don't agree with, like resistance is natural. Like it's just natural to go, mm, I don't think we should do this. Now, it's not because you don't want to do it. <laughs> it's because you're not comfortable with it yet or you, do, or you don't have the language to express yourself. And that's what's so powerful with tools like this is you're giving them words and language to express that difference so that then they can even converse about it. It's not a, well, you're stupid for thinking that sort of approach. <laughs> They've now got language to discuss that we're just different. All right, well, what does that mean? Exactly. You know, and, and, you know, our fears about things, they're real to us. You know, just because they're not real to the partner, they're real to the individual. And so, you know, the more you can unearth wherever that comes from and whatever that is, um, means that, you know, who knows? They may, you know, the partner may go, oh, well, okay, I understand that fear. Fair enough. All right. Well, how can we adjust what we might do going forward, you know, that handles Absolutely. that? So, yeah. yeah that, and we're happy to, happy, to, by the way, to share that research uh, too. Mm. The study is called Not So Odd Couples uh, Crafting an Equitable Advice Experience for Modern Couples. So we can maybe just include that in the uh, show notes for, Absolutely. for your Absolutely. Yeah, really powerful. And I think, um, look, lots of us have had conversations. I, I remember doing some, let's call I mean, it's far more exciting than goal setting. I was actually trying to get them to really draw out the adventures they'd love to go on this couple. And they were sort of like, you know, 40s and 50s and, and you know, kids getting older. Or what would you love to do? And, and you know, they, they were giving me the usual boring things. So I guess we should focus on retirement and, you know, whatever. And finally, just as I sort of revved them up, he admitted that he want, he's always wanted to pull apart and rebuild a motorcycle. I'm not going to remember which type it was. 
I'm sure it wasn't a Harley. But anyway, so there was this a picture he had in his garage of pulling one apart and with his mates rebuilding it and going on a trip. And the look of absolute shock on her face, they'd been married for a very long time and she had never heard that before, you know? And I was like, oh my goodness. And so to them, to then see advice as like a discovery process even about each other, like that's powerful too, right? That's that's sort of some magic you can deliver. Yeah, Surely. for sure. For sure. So let's talk about the tool in terms of I'm assuming that it's sort of a standalone tool. It's not really designed to be integrated with anything else or or other other tech, or do you guys do that maybe on a bigger end of town basis? Is there any sort of integrations that you've got with capital preferences? Uh, I think it's a super important part of the strategy for us in Australia and we're yep. um and we've been speaking to advisors about exactly where they want those integrations to reside, and some of them okay. are underway already. But um, we see advisors using it for acquisition, so getting to know new clients for these annual review moments where they are checking in where the client mm-hmm. sits uh, and exploring goal achievability, and then also in the re-engagement of, let's say, the next generation. And, and those t- that tends to leave, leave it to be in a discovery category that not a lot of other Tools in the industry or suites in the industry really do. In fact, some of the largest providers of financial planning solutions are actually decommissioning those that that part of their their uh, suite or tools. Yeah. And so, but but we're continuing to learn where the where the where the industry wants those integrations to occur. Clearly, in CRM, that's like a very obvious area. You want to make sure the yeah. data gets back to your CRM that it's there, uh, and you can find it in in multiple. Places so we're actively actively working on those for the obvious, and just, yeah. yeah, for the obvious reasons. Um, and you've just prompted a couple of thoughts there. One, so you know, somebody we utilize the tool with a client that's new to us. We do it on in the onboarding. We come to review time. This is something that like that client then lives in the system, and it's sort of looking back. Is that so? It's not like it's a new one, and then the advisor is the person that looks and compares. Is that part of the tool? Is going oh, you know, warning, Will Robinson. <laughs> This is quite different to last time. Absolutely. Like I think the best the best users, uh, the best advisors and, and their staff set the expectation we're doing this and this is something we're going to check in in again 12 yeah, months okay. and they set that date and then at that 12-month anniversary, the client would just get an email say, hey, it's time for us to check in and see how you're thinking about your money these days. We want to see you make a few more decisions. That data would come back, the advisor would be notified and then- be able to look side by side and say, okay, things look like they're in the same realm that they've always been. Maybe I don't press anything or maybe I do. And I think an important distinction about the solution, which is unique to like the typical risk profiling kind mm. of mindset that people would have is we, we do do all of the exploratory vis- visualizations of how the client's comfort zone compares to their goal achievability and the retirement right. income or deaccumulation sense. So that that can also be a live discussion that continues. And it's a really light one and very, very visual. So you uh, that also could occur annually or periodically when the client or the advisor does that visualization of where the client yeah, okay. is in their comfort zone versus where their goals achievability stand. I guess I'm also curious too, because there will be an element of almost training, you know, for this for for advisors. It's it's a different way of doing things. Is uh, there's got to be situations where, in fact, the client sort of responding similarly would be odd. So if we'd, for example, if we'd had this client for a little while pre-COVID and you tested them in the middle of lockdown, I would have thought you'd expect a bit of change, wouldn't you? Like environmentally, I I would have thought somebody tested then you'd expect something to be a bit different. Is that valid? Is is that the sort of thing you'd expect to come out of the test if it was done again? I think it depends on, you know, what was going on for that client. So for COVID itself- it did bring some micro shocks to people's environment. It could yep. have lowered their income. It could have uh, lowered their job security. It could have brought about health concerns. All of those things you would expect impact someone's, let's say, willing to take risk or their social preferences and things such as that. So, yeah, you should absolutely see that occur. Yeah, and and that's yeah, that's the powerful thing. It's kind of like in a, a snapshot and a doorway into that conversation. Yeah. Which which you see through someone's decisions, but maybe not any other 
Right, means absolutely, and and because I I have no doubt it it impacted with other things. There would you know even just decisions to head back out. Even now, there'd be people saying they're still not as social as they were prior to to lockdowns and things like that. It's 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 changed their behaviour, you know. Um, and so you know all of these things are great to understand. I'm also curious, you know, you mentioned Pat the um studies and the work that's done on couples. I'm curious if you've yet gone to the intergen. I mean, we've got this huge intergenerational wealth transfer that's going to be happening. Um, you know, and in Australia, the annual amount is going to be bigger than the amount going into super each year. We're going to hit that point where the dollars are that big. Um, is have you done any work or seen any work about the differences in responses between generations, you know, and, and how you can draw that out and help people understand that difference, um, you know, as families sort of move forward and the wealth does start to transfer. Yeah, it, in all of the academic work that we've done in this domain, PETA, for, for risk preferences, you know, what you continue to see is high individual variation within a, any particular age cohort. Right. Generally, as people age, you'll see that their loss aversion ticks up, so they become a bit more conservative. But that's the general pattern. You couldn't predict for any particular individual right. the spread around that, where they're going to be off of the mean, because they could be yeah. quite some distance off the mean. So it really is highly individualized to mm. the the individual people in those generations, it turns yeah. out. And you know, I think it comes back to those when we studied the risk preference differences between partners 60% of the time, there being a meaningful difference. I expect you'd see the same thing if you looked father to daughter or mother to son or, you know, to, to grandchildren. So it's highly individualized. We do. And we do see it's sort of a, our work with more of a family office type clients, advisors using these types of methods to get, to, to bring the, the children into the fold, maybe in their early twenties or even as they're approaching university each mm. and, you know, teaching them a little bit about, Hey, you know, Mom, dad would love to see how you're thinking about money these days and like what yep. where do you where do you sit? And then able to plot all of the family in one kind of continuum. It's like, okay, mom's the most aggressive. Uh, then it comes Jane, then it comes Joe, then it comes dad. You know, he's he's the you know, it's you, you can see why it it's tough to get dad to do certain <laughs> things here. Yeah. You know, to yeah. you know, dad's pretty conservative. He's not gonna be buy the second home. He's going to be buying right. bonds. Uh, and so that's that type of dynamic conversation is really a great way to reach into the next generation and bring yeah. them into the money fold. And really, I think highlighting that different approach can be so powerful because I think, you know, the older generation will be all about those kids. They need to learn about this stuff, right? So there's a lot of almost condescension about that, but also it is, it is helpful, but there would be condescension where I think actually there's insights the other way too, because I, I think, I mean, I interact with a lot of parents who are making decisions about their own financial future based on huge assumptions about what they think their kids would want to do. Like, oh, the kids would no, never want to sell the family home. I mean, they'll want to, they'll want to always have the family home. I'm like, okay, are they never going to want to go overseas to work? Are they never going to want to like, like these, these huge assumptions? Whereas at least having something like this where everybody can, can, you know, get their different results and you can sort of talk that through can be a way to almost draw out they're going to approach life differently to you. It's just how it is. Yeah. You can even see it yeah. just in this test. Let's talk about that. Let's actually have the conversation with them about what they want might, might want in the future, particularly adult kids, rather than just assuming that this is what they'll do going forward. Yeah. And everyone loves self-discovery. Like yeah. there's, well, there's, well, some people don't, but, but for the vast <laughs> large majority, and certainly that next generation, as I look at you know my older child, they're mm. really curious about, looking inward. Uh, and so giving them something that helps them do that in, in an area where they're probably uh, would sell they want help from hopefully the yeah. same financial advisors is pretty powerful. And look, uh, what I love too is ultimately empowering, you know, and I think actually uh, ultimately that, f well, for me is our job. Our job is to empower people, like let them feel confident and competent, right? So the more you can give them these tools that help them understand themselves and why they're doing things and how that impacts their choices and and what the end result of that is, like that's that's pretty exciting um, to be able to empower them that way. Um, you know, it's 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 yeah. I think it's the instead of the I'm a technician, here's a technician answer. 
um, which can still be valuable. There's still a lot of, you know, specialists uh, can be incredibly valuable. But I think as a broader industry, um, I think there's a way forward that is deeper into this behavioral science um, sort of focus that that will change lives, you know, will really change the way they go forward. I'm curious, Bernard, on what is on the development path, you know, what's sort of coming up into the future and also what's a bit blue sky, what's out there that you'd love to tackle? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, so on the on the path for us are different dimensions of understanding clients that are super important to uh, guiding them on their well-being journeys with things mm. such as I mentioned earlier, values-based investing or ESG or sustainable-based investing, understanding clients' preferences in those domains and helping them understand how that relates to various strategies that they can deploy. So being able to say, you know, I looked at your preferences and this portfolio that we're going to put you in is an 80% fit with your sustainable or ESG-based preferences. Yeah. Like the simplicity of that comes from the science. And so we're, we've launched that in the UK and I think it has a place in Australia. So stay tuned for that mm. soon. Um, also, this whole space of retirement income certainty. Yep. And you know, one of the reasons why people are maybe getting the most enjoyment out of retirement that they could is because there's a fear factor that they might run out of money. They don't un- they haven't channeled their their longevity or certainty preferences. And so mm. helping advisors surface those and then develop the right deaccumulation strategies is gonna be super important. We just um yeah, we just met and Pat and specifically met with Treasury and APRA and ASIC in the last month or so on this topic and some of the new research we've just published has been throughout the papers in the last uh, couple of weeks. So uh, maybe we'll, we can also put this study up on this uh, in the notes, but yeah. it's a really, really powerful area for advisors to, I think, to engage on this. Yeah, on this I, topic. I completely so, agree, but particularly, um, I mean, I've had a couple of clients where, in fact, they had concerns about like getting the bare minimum, like there was like a level of income they just wanted to know they could get, you know, and and were actually willing to take a hit on upside if they can just get a certain level. But of course, that was just the bare minimum, you know, and so having a way to construct things such that they understand both what they're trading in that, but feel confidence and see that come in and they're like, that's fantastic. I know that's always coming and like understanding who that suits, who it doesn't, like those things are really powerful. The the yeah. optimal mathematical outcome is not a realistic way to advise. We've got to balance what makes them feel good, you know, what makes them feel like they can celebrate their retirement, not be wary yeah. the whole time. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I do think that the key takeaway that I think is the most, the biggest aha moment is if you understand the client in a in a scientific way, it actually simplifies the way you can explain right. all the various strategies by just saying, this strategy is a 70% fit with your preferences. This one's an 80% fit. It'll be slightly uncomfortable here, but we'll be able to right. manage through that. And it's just, yeah, it's, just, it's, a, great, it's a great benefit of that whole yeah. approach. And also, I yeah, think probably science. because of that fit, it also gives them language to use to others that might question that. You know, if they've got some, but why are you doing that? Why aren't you doing this? Doesn't fit me. You know, so they'll have some language to to respond to that rather than feeling, oh, maybe I'm no good at this or maybe I'm not smart enough at money or like they they understand why they're there, um, yeah, which is really exciting. Pat, is there anything else we've missed? I believe you guys have an offer you'd love to to give to the listeners. We certainly do. Uh, thanks, Peter. So um, for folks who have had their um, curiosity piqued, uh, it will include a link in the show notes for folks to request a demo if they'd like, or they can also go to capitalpreferences.com.au and just mention this podcast, and uh, we'll be happy to give them a month free so they can get rolling with it and uh, and you know, as we were talking about before, start to put it into play and think about how they shape their bedside manner to to get to these deeper insights with clients. Absolutely. All right, Advice Explorers, if you'd like to find out more about Capital Preferences, then you know, the website link will be in the show notes. As uh, the gentleman mentioned, we'll include all sorts of things in there that we've been talking about, um, the reports, some of this academic work that's been done, along with Bernard and Pat's LinkedIn details. Thank you so much for joining us here today, folks, and really sharing how 
capital preferences that can sort of help lift us out of the historical risk profiling doldrums that we've all been living in. So thank you for all giving us some hope and, and sharing this sort of new wave of behavioral science into the future. Thank you, Peter. Thank you so much, Peter. And it's been fun. Look forward to connecting with everyone. Take care. So, are you a current user of Capital Preferences? Maybe you started to check it out after the Ensemble PD day. You've had a bit of a play. You know, has it been something you found really valuable? Please share your insights on the Ensemble community platform. Um, as I'd certainly love to hear your take, and I'm sure there'd be other uh, advisors in the community that would really love to hear how you found it, what worked, what things you had to work on, and how you managed to implement it in your practice. As for my thoughts, I think this is, um, you know, a journey we're all going to be going on where we sort of go from providing a service or, you know, the SOAs, like that's what we think we provide through to really um, changing the way we look at the, the things we deliver to clients. You know, I mean, risk profiling becomes a journey of self-discovery for them. You know, they can really learn more about themselves, learn how they interact with their partners, maybe even how they in the future will interact with their adult kids. You know, this is something that can really add value to them as an individual um, and their self-awareness. You know, maybe modeling becomes unlocking a world of future possibilities, right? It's it's just an, a different way to really look at what we do and how we do it. You know, how can we create small, valuable experiences in each step of the advice journey rather than just as a whole. So, you know, ultimately what we deliver is a transformation. You know, they really do go down this path where they feel like they are in a different position or even partly see the world differently at the end of the exercise with us. So, you know, and I think tools like this are, are part of that. Um, there's others out there in other parts of the advice journey, um, but I think each of us can, you know, benefit from taking a really good look at at what we're delivering and and what it feels like to transform. You know, we've all been through that. Maybe it's through exercise or, or through your health or all sorts of other th- ways you've experienced that. Now, how can we bring that to advice? How can we really change people's futures such that they recognize it rather than just the numbers recognizing it? Now, as you know, there's only one skill we need to become bionic advisors, and that's avid curiosity. And to help you build that habit, today's Curiosity Corner website that I wanted you to take a look at is something a little different this time. This is the Snappy Kraken State of Digital Marketing Report. Now, you'll find it on the Snappy Kraken website. Um, if you Google Snappy Kraken, that's Snappy, that's S-N-A-P-P-Y, Kraken, K-R-A-K-E-N, and then Uh, state of digital, it'll pop up. It'll also be in the show notes. And basically, this is actually a US tool. We don't have access to Snappy Kraken here in Australia just yet, but uh, they it, it's a marketing tool for financial advisors and they've put together this 2024 report. Um, and I just think it's really interesting to get us to think about where we invest our energy when it comes to marketing as advisors. Maybe you're listening to this and go, oh, goodness, Peter, I don't want to do any more marketing. I can't take any more leads. Um, well, then woohoo and you know, high five to you. Um, but if maybe you're getting lots, but maybe they're not the not the right type of leads, right? They're not quite the clients you want to be dealing with. Marketing can make a huge difference with that. And for anybody out there who maybe is changing their niche or or shifting the business, looking for new leads, then I think understanding where these can come from or where the bang for buck exists can be really valuable. So there's all sorts of insights in the report. Um, you know, the sort of thing like, you know, text in only email open rates might sit at 27%, but if they've got a video in them, they sit at 59% as an open rate, right? These insights that I think all of us could probably, you know, go through the report and get some really valuable tips and tricks of things, you know, that we can change in the way we do things. Um, the report is, you know, 42 pages, to be honest. Most of it's though very visual. It's not hard to step through. Uh, so I really would encourage you to take a look. Um, there's ins- insights about, you know, your website, your email, socials, all sorts of things here to sort of challenge where we put our energy um, as we go forward in 2024. So if um, you take a look at that, you find it interesting, there's something that stood out for you, please do, um, you know, reach out, pop it in the Ensemble community. And I'm sure we'd love all love to sort of debate what we see in there and how much of what we feel is relevant to Australia, how much is different. You know, let's uh, get that conversation started. Well, that's all we've got for this week, folks. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you'll get your advice tech fix automatically sent to you each Friday. Now, as I've mentioned in the last couple of episodes, um, this one here 
will be my last tech interview on the podcast. Um, I will be turning up next week to introduce you to the new host of the Ad- Advice Tech Podcast. I will not disclose yet. So you'll hear about it next week. However, as we sort of hit the pause button right on my chapter with the Ensemble Advice Tech Podcast, I can't help but feel like we've been on sort of one heck of a journey together, don't you think? Um, you know, a big shout out to the Ensemble crew for happily tossing me the keys to this wild ride. Um, folks, your trust has been like sort of finding an extra life in a vintage video game. You know, it's been absolutely priceless um, to our superhero sponsor, NetWealth. You know, you've really f- fueled this journey. Um, so with your support, you know, you've made sure that we just never ran out of gas, you know, as we zip through our tech cosmos in our, in our journeys each week. Um, and let's talk about our guests. To be honest, the real MVPs, uh, you folks have been the secret source. You know, you've generously shared your time. You sort of blown our minds with all of the different tech wizardry and you've really turned up each episode. You've create, turned it into a masterclass uh, and taught all of the listeners something new each week. And for that, you know what? You deserve a standing ovation or at the very least, a very enthusiastic high five. So thank you so much to our guests. And finally to you, the listener, um, my fabulous tech enthusiasts, you're the reason this podcast has been such a blast. Your appetite appetite for the episodes, your messages to me, the chats we've had at industry events have been like getting fan mail, folks. It's so, so very heartwarming and the absolute highlight of my day. Seeing the leaps you are making with tech in your practices is like watching the magical final scene of an 80s movie. It's triumphant, it's inspiring, and it just makes me want to punch the air in victory, to be honest. So, While I'm stepping aside to let another fabulous host take the mic, this absolutely isn't game over for me. I'll pop back now and then, uh, ready to dive back into the sort of tech treasure chest with you all. So for the last time in my host hat, but not forever, I promise, remember to stay curious, keep pushing buttons, exploring new levels, and let's keep winning at this advice tech game together. So thank you, my fellow advice explorers, for making this podcast the raddest ride in the advice tech galaxy. Best of luck. Goodbye.